evening to everyone. Welcome to our Thursday night class. Good to have you all here tonight. Uh, as you uh, already know who are in the audience, we have uh, the honor of having Pastor Bill Wenstrom with us from Iowa, out visiting uh, his family during his summer vacation. Also had the honor of him performing my oldest daughter Jessica's wedding uh, about two weeks ago uh, tomorrow. Be two, two weeks already. Holy cow. Two, two weeks ago tomorrow uh, will be... Uh, uh, her, the anniversary of a wedding, <laughs> I guess you could say that. <laughs> they made it two weeks. They're not even back from the honeymoon yet. But uh, uh, Bill did the uh, wedding there and the ceremony and everything was beautiful, went well, and uh, the hand of God was all over it uh, through Bill. So that was fantastic and uh, appreciate him coming out and being with us tonight and also uh, uh, visiting with him over the past week or so as well. So it's great to have you with us. All right. Yep. No, I'm saving that for Sunday when there's more people here. So. <laughs> <laughs> prove it, I'll prove it. But your handwriting was kind of scratchy, so that I couldn't really make out the scores that good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, uh, again, uh, thank you for Bill being here with us tonight. And um, also... Uh, keep in uh, your prayers my mom. Uh, she was admitted to the hospital uh, yesterday, and um, uh, she's in there with congest uh, potentially congestive heart failure. Uh, she uh, has been retaining uh, fluids in her body, and uh, especially in her lung area with a you know, terrible cough and whatnot, and um, not able to lie down vertically and sleep, and et cetera. Um, so she's in. She's getting treated now, and they're doing some uh, procedures uh, for her today and tomorrow, and hopefully you can uh, find out what uh, is going on and whatever diagnosis that they can uh, have for her and uh, whatever treatments that she may need. So please keep that in uh, your prayers in the coming days. Uh, we were talking about Kayla, so let's continue to keep Kayla and her uh, leg uh, issue, uh, the infection that she has in her ankle that's been going on for over six months now. Let's uh, keep that in prayer and uh, for healing and recovery there. And is there anything else that we could be praying for tonight? And uh, the Johnson, certainly keep the Johnson family in your prayer. Again, a, 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 a friend of our families and also a co-worker of Beth's uh, uh, who has uh, uh, stage 4 or 5 cancer or whatever it may be. And um, uh, d basically just keep keeping him comfortable at this point in time. So it uh, seems like he's uh, walking through the shadow of the valley. And uh, but let's uh, pray that the Lord take him home and bring peace and comfort uh, in a beautiful way to him and his family as well. So uh, keep George Johnson in your prayers if you could. All right. So uh, other than that, um, uh, we have Communion Sunday on Sunday, so we'll be celebrating that. Looking forward to that. Uh, a week from tonight, uh, which will be July 5th, we're not going to have our Thursday night class. All right. So I'm canceling that next Thursday. Uh, so no Thursday night class next week. All right, so let's then begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves the opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique to ensure the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor, without which we could not learn or apply the Word of God. So, if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day in praise and worship to glorify you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you for all that you have done for us and our families and also for our church, especially the word that you have for us this evening. We thank you for blessing us through your Spirit to give us this word and to understand that word. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the word, and also his work upon the cross for our personal salvation, his mediatorship for our daily walk and daily lives. And we thank you, Father, for your great plan watching over us, protecting, guiding, and blessing us, and also disciplining when necessary according to your will. So, Father, we thank you for all that you have done, both physically and spiritually within our lives, and we ask that you continue to provide those things for us. Father, this evening we pray for my mother who uh, is in the hospital, and we ask for healing and uh, blessings to be in her life and good treatment there. We pray for Kayla and the leg infection that she has and that uh, healing comes to her and uh, appropriate procedures and uh, uh, functions happen, and uh, she regains uh, the health of her leg. 
We also pray for the Johnson family this evening, and we ask that you be with the family, and especially with George, who is going through that illness, Father, and we just ask that you have your hand upon him and his family and bring comfort, happiness, and joy in their lives. And we thank you, Father, for a victory potential in your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for all that you have given us and provided. We ask that you lead us now in concentration and focus on the word that you have for us this evening. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. <coughs> all right. And Cheryl, if you'd like to come forward for our doxology. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the evening our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. All right, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you for the doxology this evening. And now, if you like, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Psalm 148, Psalm 148. And as you know, uh, we're just about uh, to be done with uh, our continued doxology of noting one of the Psalms before our classes and our services. And uh, as you know, there's 150 of these Psalms, 151 in the Septuagint. Uh, so we'll uh, add that one to it just for fun. But uh, we're almost done with the 150 psalms that we've been noting. And this is Psalm 148. And we have 14 verses here. And this is a great psalm uh, really exhorting all of creation to give praise to the Lord. As it says in verse 1, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Praise Him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling His word. Mountains and all hills, tree, uh, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above hev earth and heaven, and he has lifted up a horn for his people. Praise for all his godly ones. Even for the ones of Israel, a people near to him, praise the Lord. So again, a great praise of the Lord, seeing his creative act and the creation that he has and how all of creation should be praising him and giving thanks to him for all that he does. All right, let's turn in our Bibles now. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And tonight we are going to finish up our study of the full armor of God that we have been noting for the past, and Cheryl went back and uh, told us it was the past three months we've been noting this. So again, we've been noting the full armor of God in verses 14 through 17 in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 over the past three months. It's been a fantastic study. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. I know personally I have and have learned much from this study. But tonight we're wrapping it up, giving a little bit more summarization to what we've been noting overview wise and also application wise as we go forward in our lives now knowing what the armor of God is and having the responsibility to pick it up and put it on and stand firm in the day of evil and as we've been noting and also with the graphics that have been showing you remember the Christian soldier is commanded and we need to stand firm stand firm against Satan and his cosmic system the evil rulers of the fallen angels who are controlling this world 
the temptations that they throw at us through the media, through even sometimes government or social outlets or whatever the case may be, any of the airwaves that are communing in, uh, commu uh, communicating, let me finish that word, communicating information to us. Again, they are all have influence of Satan and his cosmic system on a predominant level. And therefore, they are all trying to tempt us away from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ so that we walk in sin, we walk in self-gratification, and we walk alone to the exclusion of our walk with God. So therefore, we need to stand firm and not let those temptations overrun us, overrule us within our soul, continue to have the mentality of our mind, soul, our heart, with all our power and with all of our strength, being focused on God, being focused on the Lord by having His Word resonant within our soul through the filling of the Holy Spirit to apply that on a consistent basis. We need to stand firm. But God doesn't just say, stand firm on your own, and I'm going to leave that up to you to figure it out. No, He's given us all the power, resources, and assets. He's given us His Spirit, and He's given us the Word that defines what this armament is all about so that we can learn it, understand it, and then apply it. That's our responsibility as professional Christians, as soldiers of our Lord Jesus Christ. So... <clears throat> As we uh, kind of wrap things up and as we look at the imagery of this full armor of God, what is interesting about this is that all of the armament is from the viewpoint of a frontal assault. Really, there's no talk by Paul or the Holy Spirit, as we would note here, in this scripture or the other scriptures that we see the portions of the armament of God given to us, old and new, anything about the backside. But we can assume that the breastplate of righteousness certainly didn't just hang on the front. It had to be wrapped around the back. So they might have had some armament on the back, but certainly had to be tied there and therefore tightened up around the chest. Certainly the shield was out in front, the helmet of salvation. Yes, that's front and back and from the sides as well, because as you know, the helmet of salvation that is going to attack the most vital part of your being, especially in the spiritual realm, your soul, it can come from any direction, frontwards, backwards, sidewards, upwards, downwards, okay? Satan tries from any angle. So we see, again, a little bit of that. The sword of the spirit, that typically, too, is a frontal assault, assault type of defensive and offensive weapon that God has given to us. But again, we emphasize most of it is a frontal assault that we are recognizing. As we talked about the sword of the spirit, the intimacy of that up close and personal hand to hand combat where the other armament also is for up close and personal, but also from afar when the flaming arrows are shot from a far distance away. But the sword of the Spirit really puts it together, the up-close, personal, the intimacy of these temptations that Satan and his cosmic system sends at us. And oh, by the way, I think I might have mentioned this uh, back when we began this study. If you've never read C.S. Lewis's book on the, called The Screwtape Letters, please read it. It's a fantastic book in regard to the personal, intimate, one-on-one -on -one assault between Satan's cosmic system and your sin nature uh, and, and also your soul. Again, it talks about that intimacy of that relationship. It does a fantastic job of giving you a uh, a kind of a real-world explanation of how Satan and his cosmic system truly works. But again, we talk about frontal assault, the intimacy of all of that, but none of this equipment talks about the backside. And some of that reason is, is for the fact that if we turn and run from our enemy, guess what's going to happen? We are going to be defeated. You see, when you stand firm and you face your enemy with the power of God, with the armament of God, you will be successful. You will be victorious. But if you turn tail and run away from your enemy, now it's exposed. The backside, which we have nothing about the armament of protection about. Therefore, God doesn't want us to be turning and running. And what does turning and running mean? It means what we're doing now is turning really away from God and turning towards sin. When we allow fear, worry, anxiety, or any other type of sin to penetrate our soul due to the temptations that are coming at us each and every day, we are what? Turning our back and running away. 
truly turning our back on God because we're not walking in his relationship, but in essence turning our back on our enemy and letting them easily defeat us as we enter into sin. So we are most vulnerable at that aspect and most vulnerable at that point. And one of the commentaries that I was uh, reading going through this study also noted and reminded me, there's another book out there, if you've never read it, called Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Again, uh, a writer, was he back in the 1600s, 1700s? I forget what it was. But, uh, you know, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress and another good understanding of kind of a real-world experience of the Christian walk and the struggles uh, and sometimes failures that we have and the temptations of Satan. But in this commentary, he says it's interesting that in the book Pilgrim's Progress, no, Bunyan didn't write it. Bunyan was a character. No, no, Bunyan wrote it. Sorry. Bunyan says Christian, okay, who was one of the characters, has no armor for his back. The best option then is to hold his ground. And when we put on the armor of God, we too can hold our ground against the evil one as we advance spiritually in our own lives and advance the gospel into the world. Again, into Satan, uh, Satan's world and his cosmic system. So as Bunyan wrote that, he recognized the fact that Christian, again, the character there, did not have armament for the back. And therefore, the only thing to do then is not turn, because if you turn away from God, you're going to be defeated. The only thing you then should do is stand your ground, because you've got everything necessary to be victorious. So <clears throat> as we understand then, when we face our enemy, in other words, when we face the temptations over our soul, or the temptations that come towards our soul, and we face them head on with the word of God, you will be able to stand your ground. You see, and one of the great things that Satan wants you to do is to lose faith in the armor that God has given to you, to lose trust in it, to doubt it, to worry about, ooh, do I have enough, or is God's power enough for me in this situation? Satan loves to even tempt you in that area. But what we have to keep reminding ourselves is what the Word of God tells us. When we put on the armor of God, it will lead us to victory. It's when we take off the armor of God, which I'm going to give you a good example of that as we uh, conclude our service this evening. As we take off that armor of God or doubt in it or don't trust in it and don't truly utilize it, that's when we are most vulnerable and that's when we will be defeated. So we need to pick up and put on this armor so that we can hold our ground and not just hold, but as we noted in the sword of the spirit, defeat the enemy, defeat the enemy. Jesus Christ has already defeated the enemy. They're already a defeated enemy. But yet there are skirmishes going on. We just need to mop up, as it were, have the mop-up operations of these little skirmishes called temptations over our soul and allow us to be victorious in the mop-up operation. And God allows us to do that through His strength, His power, and His armament so that we win the battle over our heart, our soul, our mind, over the thought process that we have truly over our soul. And these virtues that we've understood here in this armament of faith and uh, trust and salvation and uh, the sword of the Spirit and shouting your feet with the gospel of peace, all of them are various virtues that we need to pick up and put on taking the various aspects of what the Word of God says about those things and walking in them on a daily basis. We need to pick up those virtues and go forward. Again, God has given us these things, and we have to recognize what they are and how they apply within our lives and let them be part of who we are. It's interesting that we have shotting our feet with the gospel of peace, plus we have the helmet of salvation. The gospel is what led you to salvation. Salvation is the result of the gospel. But they go hand in hand. But it's interesting how Paul says, uh, uh, you know, a, a few times within his writings to the various churches. He doesn't say that always the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does he say? My gospel. He says, it's my gospel of peace. It's my salvation. It's my sword of the spirit, which is the word. It is my shield of faith. It is my breastplate of righteousness. You see, and he wasn't saying in an arrogant way, like, you know, he came up with these things. But what he was saying is taking ownership of the things that God had created and given to him. 
It wasn't just God's doing it. Now it was his because he took it on completely and wholeheartedly. Now it became part of who and what he is. That's the virtues connected with this armor of God. And don't just think of them as kind of this, you know, uh, secondary or tertiary type of, you know, equipment that you pick up and every now and again put on or utilize it here or utilize it there. No, it's something that becomes part of who and what you are. And again, we can almost, I'll say it this way from a scientific standpoint, you know, we're what we call endoskeleton. In other words, our skeletal structure is on the inside and we have flesh on the out. But you take a thing like a clam or a lobster, and what are they considered? Exoskeleton. Their hardest part is on the outside, the shell, that gives them protection from their enemies. And you see, what we need to do is make the endoskeleton nature of the Word of God become our exoskeleton defense against Satan and his cosmic system. Do you all follow that? Spirit just led me on that one, so hopefully I, I said it in the right way, okay? But in any case, that's what this is. That's what this armament is all about. The exoskeleton that becomes part of who and what we are. It's not just out there anymore. Now it's part of who we are. And that's what Paul has described to us and given to us, not only in the other writings, and not only is God the Holy Spirit given to us, as I'm going to share with you this evening, in the Old Testament and the New but when we look at the book of Ephesians all by itself, the whole armor of God, as I began this study, is explained to you throughout this passage. All you need to do, uh, uh, let me say it this way, throughout the book. And all you need to do is take these passages and the buzzwords that we've been noting here about the different pieces of armament and go back and see where they were also talked about in Paul's writing in this book and this book alone. And you have all the information you need to know about all the pieces of armament. Let me remind you of those things. When we talk about the belt of truth, again, girding your loins with the truth. Paul talked about the truth in Ephesians 1.13, 4.15, 24, and 25, and also chapter 5, verse 9. And remember, when we started this study, we read each of these verses. And we understood what Paul was saying about the belt of truth from the book of Ephesians by itself. Go back and review those things. Remind yourself of these things. But he's talked about it already in this book. When we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, he's talked about righteousness in chapter 4, verse 24, and also in chapter 5, in verse 9. And it gives us definition of what this righteousness is all about and how we should apply it to our everyday lives. What God has done for us to give us righteousness and how we ought to walk in that righteousness daily. When we talk about the preparation of the gospel of peace, certainly the gospel has been mentioned in chapter 113 and 36, but also peace. Breaking down the dividing barrier really speaking about between Jew and Gentile and making us one, one body in Christ, but really talking about what Christ did at the cross, destroying the enemy called sin and bringing peace between God and man. Chapter 2, verse 14 and 18, 4, 3, 6, 19, and also in verse 23. So again, Paul has given us the understanding of what the gospel of peace is all about that we need to be prepared with in our own mind and ready to give a defense for the faith that is in us. Then we note the shield of faith. And as I said to you in regard to the shield, and I can't you know, say it enough how this was the largest piece of armament that they had. Remember, the Roman shield was almost the size of a door. The word they used for this, the thorax, in the Greek language also meant a doorway or a door itself. It was huge because faith is huge in the Word of God. To use a technical word, it's huge, okay? It's huge, okay? So faith is a major portion and the major portion of the spiritual life. It gets you into, again, the family of God from the day of your conversion when you believed in Jesus Christ, and it leads you every step of the way until the day we're taken home in eternal glory. And so Paul even talked about it more than all the others in chapter 1, 13, 15, and 19, chapter 2, chapter 3, 12, and uh, 17, 4, 5, and thir uh, also verse 13, and he'll talk about it again as we wrap it up in chapter 6, verse 23. Faith is a major portion of the spiritual life, and it has an effect to extinguish the flaming missiles of the evil one. 
Then when we talk about the helmet of salvation, verse 13 almost encompasses all of these, but the gospel once again, uh, 2, 5 and 8, and also 5, 23. Again, knowing what your salvation is, both your past, your present, and your future salvation as defined by the word of God. And then lastly, in the armament, we've noted the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 1.13 and also chapter 5, verse 26. And when you read these passages and understand the context and also the passages that are around each of these that give greater definition to what's going on, you understand the full armor of God. But it's not just here in the book of Ephesians, as I said, Old Testament, New Testament. It's given to us throughout. And in fact, you know, we many times stop and, you know, and, and uh, when we look at the armor of God, we always are assuming that Paul was talking about the Roman soldier. But there's nothing in this passage to say Paul is saying, I'm speaking about a Roman soldier, other than the assumption that he was under prison guard, okay, and the guardianship was by Roman soldiers, and he understood what their armament and equipment was all about. Again, we could uh, assume that very uh, nicely and understand that. But as I've said to you before, even the Israelites had certain types of armor. The Greeks had certain types of armor as well. But the fact of the matter is the Old Testament and especially the book of Isaiah, mentions all these pieces of armament in one way or another. So we would better say that Paul knew his Old Testament scripture, especially Isaiah, which we call the gospel of the Old Testament, the gospel of Isaiah, we could call it. Again, in prediction of the coming Messiah. But basically, uh, Isaiah spoke very much about the various pieces, the breastplate, the sword, the shield, all of these different things that we see in Paul's definition of the armor of God. And in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17, we talked about how it by itself talks about the breastplate of righteousness and also the helmet that we have and that we are to put on. Then uh, continuing that, we also understand in Isaiah chapter 34, in verses 5 and 6, and also in chapter 66, verse 16, the Lord has a sword. And we understand the sword that the Lord carries. And yes, you could look at it from a military perspective in his defense of the people of Israel and all his people through the sword. But at the same time, we see that uh, the coming Messiah is also righteous and faithful. And the Hebrew word for faithful there is amuna, and amuna also means what? Truth. It's not just faithful, but truth. So we see the belt of truth also there in this armament when we look at Isaiah 34, 5 and 6, and also chapter 66, verse 16. The coming Christ would adorn himself in the armor of God. That was a section of this study that we noted. And when Christ did come, he demonstrated the armor of God for mankind, for the believer of the church age because he put it on himself to withstand all the evil temptations that he would endure right up and including the cross and then we also see that he had a belt around his waist in Isaiah chapter 11 in verse 5 so throughout the book of Isaiah we have seen these various analogies as well and Paul really just putting it all together maybe looking at the Roman soldier and accompanying all of that utilizing the Greek language to give us the understanding of what the Roman soldier would wear but basically this is Old Testament doctrine that he's bringing forward in other words these are timeless truths that were given to the Old Testament saint and the New Testament saint and all of us have the opportunity to pick up and put it on. But again, defined for the church age like never before through Paul and his writings, both to Ephesians and then in Colossians, as we've also seen the parallels as well. But in Isaiah 49.2, we see that, again, the sword is coming forward, and the sharp two-edged sword is in view. As well as in Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 and also Deuteronomy 33 29 and over 20 times in the book of Psalms I'm going to give you uh, some of these verses in just a minute up on the board speaking about the sword and the shield that the Lord is for us so again great definition in the Old Testament in the Psalms also the book of Isaiah and then other passages as well as we understand them and note them those passages include, as we have in Genesis chapter 15, here in verse 1, 
where it reads, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not fear, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. You see, the Lord is what a shield. And he was a shield to Abraham. And the word of the Lord that was given to Abraham was a shield for his soul so that he could go forward in God's plan for his life. And the Lord was his shield. Again, we know the mediatorship of Jesus Christ, which also gives us that analogy of the shielding that he does, both in the spiritual realm and in our physical realm. But we see him and his word being a great shield, both to the Old Testament and the New Testament saint as well. In Psalm chapter 3, verse 3, it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, all around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. One that lifts me up and gives me encouragement so I'm not downtrodden, I'm not depressed, or I'm not, you know, uh, uh, have anxiety and fear, worry. I'm not, um, uh, uh, lack of better words right now, self-centered and, you know, feeling all sorry for myself or whatever the case may be. No, the Lord lifts up our head. The Lord lifts it up so that we walk with strength and courage and confidence going forward in His plan because He is our shield as we go forward. Also, we see in Psalm chapter 5, verse 12, For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. It's interesting that we see there the blessings of God surrounding with favor. Whether it be your logistical grace blessings or the greater grace blessings that we have, God is providing us those things. To do what? As we compare Scripture with Scripture, increase our faith in Him, in, 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 increase our confidence in Him, increase our trust in Him as now we go forward. You surround Him with favor as with a shield. Then we see in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn of salvation, my stronghold. Again, standing firm. The stronghold means you're locked in. You're locked down. Nobody's moving you out of that place. It's your stronghold. Standing firm. The horn of salvation, the strength that we get from salvation. This horn in the Old Testament is used for an imagery of strength, figuratively for strength. My shield. Again, we see the armor of God coming forward. In Psalm chapter 18, verse 30, it says, As for God. His way is blameless. Again, the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord is tried. Again, the truth of God's word. The word of God's word. He is a shield to all who take refuge in Him. And notice in these Psalms, just to point out to you, see how it's uh, all in capitals when it says Lord? That's typically in my Bible, the NASB, what they utilize when it's the word Yahweh in the Old Testament. So we're talking about Yahweh, the Lord who is also known now as Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's used for God the Father, sometimes for the Holy Spirit, but predominantly we see Yahweh as the Lord and it being Jesus Christ. So we're understanding who the shield truly is and what it is all about and how we should pick it up and put it on. Then in Psalm chapter 28, verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, this faith, and I am helped. Therefore my heart exalts. And with my song, I shall thank him. What's that all about? Protecting the heart, the mind, the soul. Keeping it all uplifted. Keeping it all in rejoicing in the joy and the happiness that is God. Because we trust in him. The shield of faith is up. And the shield is God. And our strength is from God as well. Through his word and his spirit working within our soul. As Psalm 33, verse 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our soul waits, waiting on the timing of God. See, patience is a big part of your spiritual walk. For the impatient person, they're not going to see the armor of God working in their lives. They're not going to see God working in their lives because they want too much right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. And that's what Satan and his world is all about, especially in our day and age. The instantaneous gratification of life. And there are very few people that walk with patience anymore. 
as I like to say, hopped up here in, in, in the Northeast and the New England area, all in Dunkin' Donuts coffee, okay? You know, we're not patient for anything. But you go out to Iowa where there's a bunch of farmers out there, and I, it drove me nuts, okay? They were so slow. They wait. They drive carefully. They're not cutting you off, okay? Drove me nuts, okay? I want to be cut off. I want to drive, like, recklessly. I want to get where I want to be right now because that's from the Northeast, instant gratification. But you see, the mentality of the farmer is you've got to plant the crops. You've got to water the crops. You've got to wait on the timing of the Lord. You've got to wait for the sunshine. You've got to wait for the rain. And then after a season long, a long season, then maybe, just maybe, you'll get a harvest if the Lord blesses. You see, that is the mentality that the believer needs to have. We need to be waiting on the timing of the Lord, waiting on the patience of the Lord, faith resting in Him, but with complete confidence that in the Lord's timing, He will come and He will bless and He will defend and He will protect as you have the armor of God in your soul. In Deuteronomy 33, 29, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies will cringe before you, and you will tread upon their high places. And remember when we talked about taking out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? What happens when you do that? Not only are you defending, but you're also attacking, and the enemy will flee. The enemy will flee because the Word of God is stronger, and they know it. And remember, just go back to the uh, individual who was possessed by the legion of demons, right? And what would they say when Jesus Christ came up to them? Oh, Jesus, what do you have to do with us? Leave us alone. Leave us alone. You see, they would cringe at the sight of Jesus. They wanted nothing to do with him because they knew of the power that he has over them. And if we have the word of Jesus Christ, what does that mean? We've got that power in our souls as well. And we should be wielding that so that our enemies cringe. Again, Satan and his cosmic system, the temptations of our own sin nature. They cringe and they turn and they run ta tail between the legs and they, you know, head for the hills or whatever the case, whatever that saying is when they turn and run in cowardice. Again, because the power of God is in you when you have the armor of God. So, as such, we see that this whole armor of God, even though we've defined it in various categories of righteousness and faith and the gospel of peace, etc., salvation, what all, is it really all about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ because it all is Christ. And as we saw all those capital lords from the Old Testament writings that talked about the various pieces of armament of God, certainly the shield and the sword as we noted in Psalms, what do we see about all of them? It is Christ, and it's Christ in you. And so let's not think of Jesus Christ as this, as, uh, you know, this uh, existential being that's just out there in heaven you know, waiting for you to get there one day. No, Jesus Christ is here personally, inside of you. You are in him, he is in you. That's our union with Christ. And with his word inside of you, you then are exercising the power of Christ. And as we read earlier in, in the book of Ephesians, when he is at home in your heart, that's when that power is truly being wielded in your life. And it's all because you've picked up and put on the armor of God, which are those various virtues that are, are the Christ-like nature inside of you. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we aren't here just to have a head knowledge of what the Word of God has to say. We're here to change our lives, to be different from what we were yesterday and to be different tomorrow than we are today. You see, that's why we're here, not to just be the same person we've always been and then just, you know, think of these uh, great, and I'll say it again, existential type of uh, equipment that we can pick up that's really cool and neat and wow and wonderful, okay? No, we ought to have change in the mode of operation, in the way we think. And we do that when we pick up his virtues and apply them within our lives, when we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have the mind of Christ, as the book of Corinthians tells us. 
And therefore, as we look at all the different pieces of the armor of God, and we understand who Jesus Christ is by looking at the various aspects of the New Testament that speak about him, we see that Christ is the armament because he is truth, John 14, 6. He is our righteousness in 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He is our gospel and he is peace. So he is the gospel of peace in Mark 1, 1 and Ephesians 2, 14. He is faithfulness and makes our faith possible as well, as Galatians 2.20 tells us. And he is our salvation, as Luke chapter 2, verse 30 tells us. And then finally, he is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1.1, 1, 1. the Word became flesh, as we see in John 1.14. You see, Jesus Christ is the armor of God. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can't have Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't have the armor of God. And basically, it's like you're running around naked. And as we look at the various things that we could do in life, as you know, there are a lot of defense mechanisms that psychology defines that people put on when they're fending for themselves. And we like to call that Operation Fig Leaf. Remember Adam and the woman in the garden when they figured out that they had sinned and now they had some separation? Oh no, we're naked now. And what they do? They cover themselves with fig leaves. They tried their own human resources to cover themselves. And really, they probably didn't even come up with it themselves. Satan probably said, hey, put these things on. If, if you think you're naked, just cover up. Yeah, it'd be okay. But they were trying to cover themselves up. And Jesus Christ said, take those things off. That's valueless. It's worthless. It does you no good. But put these lambskins on. Clothe yourselves with these. In other words, clothe yourself with my sacrifice. Clothe yourself with with me. And when we do that, we have the armor of God. And so therefore, it's imperative that we know Christ more than what we ever have before and get to know him more and more and more every day. You see, when Paul uh, wrote to the Romans, let's turn there, let's go to Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. When he wrote to the Romans, he told them what to do with this armor. And it all had to do with picking up the virtues of the Christ-like nature, applying them within our lives, and then having what? Change in the mentality of our soul. Change from the way we used to do things to doing things in a new way, in the Christ-like way. As it says in uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 10, I'll start there, it says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Just so we understand, he's talking about love here. In verse 11, it says, In this do, knowing the time, that is, it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. In other words, wake up, you, you sleepy Christians. Okay, wake up. Wake up. Stop napping. Stop living in the old world that you used to live in. Wake up. It says, For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night, in other words, you know, when you're going to be brought face to face personally with Jesus Christ is a lot closer today than it was the day that you uh, were converted and were born again. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on what? The armor of light. And remember we studied this at the beginning of this, uh, un, uh, of this uh, uh, doctrine, I guess we could call it, or s uh, study. But the armor of light, another terminology. We're not just the armor of God, but the armor of light because God is light. And light represents what? His holiness, his righteousness, his goodness. You see, this is what we are to be doing. It represents his nature. It represents his being. You know, God is defined for us as what? Light. That's a whole other study that we've done in the past. And you can go back and uh, understand that better if you want to see more about the armor of light. But basically, it's Jesus Christ. Verse 13. Let us behave properly as in the day 
not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And all of you know what the flesh is. That's the old sin nature and the lust patterns of your soul or that come from the sin nature that affect your soul. So again, Put on the armor of light, put on Jesus Christ, so that you're not living by the lust patterns of your old sin nature. Unfortunately, you know, Satan is doing a great job to make people lust in our day and age. He's done it throughout history, of course, but in our day and age, we're bombarded with more imagery and more things, and our sensories being more excited with stuff every day. It's like we're all Pavlov's dog, and we got our tongue hanging out, and, uh, 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 and we're drooling all over the place. I want that, I want that, I want that. I make a little joke about my little three-year-old grandson right now. He's at that age where, you know, he's got good cognitive ability. He can speak uh, uh, much better than he could uh, just a few months ago. But he doesn't know how to control that little brain of his yet. And every time he sees something, I want that. I want to do this. I want to do that. And again, driving his parents crazy because <laughs> he wants, he wants, he wants. And everything that he sees, and you just watch him. And, you know, first he'll be looking at the book, and I want the book. Then he'll look at the computer. I want the computer. Then he looks at the, I want the table. Then he, I want this toy. I want that toy. I want this. I want that. And it's changing like that constantly. And whatever he's looking at, he wants. Again, that's the three-year-old mentality. That's natural. Are you believers who are supposed to be mature, having that same type of mentality and just lusting after everything that is thrown up at you, leading you to sin and leading you to walk away from your relationship with God? Or do you have control over your cognitive ability through the power of God and His Word in your soul? So by faith we put on the armor and trust God for the victory that He has already won for us that now we can win daily. Through his word. And that's what we call the tactical victories of the angelic conflict. The tactical victories of your soul. Because we have a greater mind than our own. We have a greater mind than our sin nature. We have a greater mind than the three-year-old mentality. We've got the mind of the omnipotent, omniscient, infinite God. And the eternal, I'll throw that in too. We've got that mind that now we can put on because he's given it to us and he gives us the ability to understand those things, combining spiritual with spiritual. And so we can put on the mind of Christ so that we don't have that mentality of letting the sin nature just rule our lives every second of the day. But if we don't put on the armor of God, you are being ruled by that sin nature every second of the day. You may not think so, and yet that doesn't mean you're committing crimes and you should go to jail. But the mentality of your soul is just not in righteousness. It's not in holiness. It's not walking with God. And it's thinking about all th other things. The lusts of the soul, as we just read. As 1 Peter 1.13, and I give you the King James Version. This is the New King James Version. Because they actually get the Greek translation right. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The New American Standard just says, therefore, you know, gird your mind, okay? But in the actual, in the Greek, it has the loins. So we see the belt of truth coming forward once again. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And yeah, we can talk about the day that he comes, the second coming of Christ. But you know what? Every day is a revelation of Christ when you learn his word. Every day, Christ is revealed to you when you learn his word and apply his word. You see, gird up your loins, be sober, put your hope in him at the revelation of Christ. That's a loaded, we could say a pregnant word. Because it's not just end times. Every day can be a revelation of Christ, and it should be as you learn his word. And we also see that the armor of God is Christ. He is the Lord. Again, see the capitals that I've got up there for your understanding. Who is our salvation and who is our righteousness? 
That's who Christ is. And I've given you over the past couple of days too about the John's vision of him in the book of Revelation and that from his mouth comes what? The sharp two-edged sword, his word. He is all of that. He is the armor of God. Again, we see Old Testament scriptures here in Exodus 15, 2. It says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. So again, he is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. Then in Jeremiah, comparing scripture with scripture, 23, 6, it says, In these days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. See, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the gospel of peace, it is the Lord. And he will be called the Lord of righteousness. And he is called the Lord of righteousness. Therefore, we should put on Christ and clothe ourselves with him. As we are also told in Romans chapter 13, 14, which we've already read. I'm going to show you that just so you're probably there. You can look at it as I show you. But also in Galatians 3, 27. We should clothe ourselves with Christ. And I give you these two, two verses, and I give them in reverse order, because Galatians 3.27, it says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with him, or with Christ. And that's the positional sanctification that we stand in. The positional clothing at the moment of your salvation. You were indwelt by all three members of the Trinity and placed in union with Jesus Christ. You stand that way positionally for all of eternity. You've clothed yourself. You've got the base work. You've got the framework for the armor of God. Really, you've got the whole armor of God. But at your salvation, you don't know what it is yet. You don't know how to use it yet. It's kind of like in the analogy of David. Remember David when he went up against Goliath? He was just a young boy at the time, okay, maybe a teenager. Kind of scrawny little kid when he faced Goliath the first time. And Saul said, here, take my equipment. You're going to need all this armor when you go out there. Take it. And he tried to put it on, but it was too big for him. He couldn't do anything with it. He said, i got to get, you know, take that stuff off, okay? Again, maybe not be the perfect analogy, but the analogy is when he was young and small, he could not put on the armor. Later on, when David grew to be a man, he was a great warrior and had all kinds of armor. But when he was young, he could not wield the armor. But in essence, he did spiritually as the Holy Spirit and Christ were with him to help him to slay the Goliath. And he did it because he had the true armor of God. on. didn't have the worldly armor. He had the true armor of God upon his soul. So again, we see that positionally at the moment of your salvation, you, re you receive the ability for the armor, and really all the armor, but you don't know how to use it yet. But as you grow and learn, as Romans 13, 14 tells us, that's when we learn how to apply this armor that is Christ, who is in you, when his word also gets in you. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. You see, if we've already clothed ourselves, as Galatians told us, why are we commanded to put it on? You see, it doesn't happen automatically. We have to learn the Word of God. That's the whole angelic conflict. Freedom of volition, freedom of choice. And success in the angelic conflict is your faith to apply what God has given to you. Put it on. Learn what it is and then apply it. A few more things and then we'll be done is that the armor of God is the gift of Jesus Christ. It truly is the gift of Christ that was given to you at salvation. Now you're learning how to apply Christ in your life. And it's given to the Christian in the greater grace blessings that he has for you. So we all have great grace blessings called salvation. The greater grace blessings are the spiritual resources and assets that God gives to us after our salvation with the accompanying blessings that are also available as a result. We've got the gift of Jesus Christ. We need to put it on and wear it and wear it proudly. 
That's another thing that is going on in our world today. They want the Christian to be ashamed of themselves, ashamed for what they believe, and ashamed for sticking to the absolute truth of the Word of God rather than the relative truth and the relative righteousness that Satan has in his cosmic system. Whatever goes. If it feels good for you, it's okay. That's not truth. But absolute truth, absolute righteousness is found in the Word. And going back to David and giving him as an example, read 2 Samuel chapter 11 sometime. That's what we call Operation Bathsheba. You all know about that story, right? Well, it's interesting that David, as it says in verse 1, it was the springtime. And again, they wouldn't fight in the winter because, you know, the grounds weren't prepared. And yet, you know, you could have no success in the winter type of fighting. So when spring came, the wars would start up again. And David sent out his army. As the king, he should have been with them, dressed in his full armor, out in battle. And he would have victory because God was with him. But he decided to stay home. He decided to what? Take off his armor and just rest in life. And the next thing you know, he sees a woman like looking down at her probably on her rooftop as his rooftop was higher. And the lust of his soul just were excited. And the next thing you know, he's committing adultery, potentially rape. Next thing you know, he's murdering at the same time. Why? Because he took off the armor of God. And he was most vulnerable when he let his armor go aside. Therefore, it's a great lesson to you and I, don't let your armor be put aside. And have your armor on. And always have your armor on. Fortunately, David, he rebounded and recovered. He put the armor back on and continued to be a great believer and a great Christian. But when he did put his armor aside, he was most vulnerable. And he was defeated. So we learn from that lesson. Don't have to learn by experience. Learn from the lessons of others, like David. Plenty of examples of losers in the Old Testament and the New. Let's learn from them. And let's not repeat the same mistakes. Let's use them as object lessons so that we focus on Christ and take the virtues of Christ. Look at the great victorious one and emulate him. And see how he deflected the temptations and how he deflected the various uh, you know, uh, 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 issues that he was faced with. Again, tempted beyond any other man. And let's learn from him because he is in us and let's put his armor on and therefore walk like never before. Because the fact of the matter is, and this is the last point for this doctrine, and there's some commentary you can read in uh, your notes as well that I've added, but you're never out of the reach of Satan. You know, David took his armor off. I'll stay at home. I won't be in danger. The battle's way out there, miles away. No, Satan is always right there. You're never out of Satan's reach. And that's the sword, the intimacy aspect of this battle. You're never out of his reach. Sometimes we think, oh, I can run and escape Satan in his cosmic system. No, you can't. You can't run. You can't hide. You can't escape it. And if that's the fact of the reality, which it is, then always have your armor on because you're always in the battle. You're always in the warfare. Sometimes there's going to be peace during wartime, but that peace is short-lived, as you know, and there's going to be another battle that comes along, another temptation, another sin that tries to come into your life. And if you put your armor aside, you're going to be vulnerable to that attack, and you will be defeated. But if you pick up and put on and keep on the armor of God and continue to walk in it, you will be victorious over and over and over again. Walking in righteousness, having that great relationship with Jesus Christ, producing divine good as we talked about this past week, and ultimately glorifying God to the maximum, which also has the added benefit of blessings and rewards in time and then also eternity. So the fact is we need to have the whole armor of God about us. And it is there for our guidance, for our protection, and then also for our forward motion. To stand your ground, but also to be victorious and win the battle over your soul each and every day. 
All right, so we'll conclude that. And as we pick it up on Sunday, we're going to talk about now the empowerment behind this armor, which is really our prayer life as we get into verses 18 through 20. So we'll talk about that on Sunday, and we'll begin a little uh, series on prayer according to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. All right, so uh, let's close now in, our, uh, in prayer with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word which is your Son, Jesus Christ, which is also the armor that you have given to us, Father. And we ask that you help us to know what that armor is more and more each and every day and how to wield it. Allow that armor, Father, to get thicker and thicker and thicker so that we are more victorious to deter the temptations that come our way from Satan and his cosmic system and even from our own old sin nature. So, Father, we thank you, and we ask that you lead us to be victorious as we leave here this evening and give us travel blessings. In Christ's precious name, amen.